Bine v-am găsit! Sunt Florentin Gheorghe, realizatorul emisiunii de vorbă cu proful de română, o emisiune în care am abordat teme despre educație, despre cultură, cu diversi invitați din diverse domenii. Iar astăzi am o surpriză pentru, pentru dumneavoastră. Am un invitat tare special pe care l-am cunoscut în cadrul unui proiect Erasmus la Sinaia, care a avut loc la Sinaia, unde au fost câte patru participanți din patru țări, din România, din Spania, din Brazilia și din Honduras. Iar unul dintre participanți din echipa Hondurei este în această seară alături de noi. Se numește Rebecca Vega, este psiholog și vom avea o discuție tare interesantă despre educație și despre anumite strategii pe care le putem aplica deopotrivă profesorii și părinții în lucrul sau în dialogul cu, cu copiii, respectiv cu, cu elevii. Um, hello Becky, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? I'm very fine and I'm very excited that you are here in my TV show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an honor for us and um, I was telling to the people uh, that mm -hmm. I met you in that Erasmus project and you're a very nice person and you're amazing <laughs> and you have some no. great ideas and uh, we are happy that you are here to share them with us. Yeah, absolutely. So, I have a first question for you. Why sure. and how are children different nowadays in comparison, let's say, with a previous generation? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess first and foremost, thank you for the invitation and, and having me here. Um, it really is an honor and a privilege. It was not something I was expecting. Um, but yes, yeah, so talking about children and how different they are from different generations. Um, definitely there's a lot of changes that happen with generations. There are different needs, there are different strategies that parents use to do some parenting, right? To um, discipline their children or how they connect with their children or um, yeah, just, just different things that happen. And also times change. There's needs that have to be met, whether that is for the family or whether that is for the children or for the adults. So definitely children have changed from one or two generations ago. I think there was a much different expectation for parents to know or to have certain things. Also quality of life was very different uh, several generations ago. And I think there was also access to mm -hmm. certain things. Um, so definitely access to technology, right, has definitely changed things. And now, as we see, um, children have different needs as well. I think in the past, they used to connect a lot more with their families. There was less electricity or there was only electricity for a certain amount of time. And so um, children and parents had to talk to each other. Parents would tell stories in the dark or the power would go off, you know, and um, it's just changed throughout. Now we have more technology. Children use it for school. Children use it for um, social media to connect with their peers. But um, there's still that need for connection. But if they are on a screen all the time or most of the time, then um, then it's their relationships are different, right? They, they are at that level and sometimes mm -hmm. that can be very superficial uh, but then that also means that they uh, stay spend time away from their from their families or they don't communicate or share as many stories anymore so definitely um, the, ch the children or the generations and the needs uh, have changed throughout throughout time I think because of all those different factors as well parents also have more needs to provide for the family so definitely cost of life has gone up mm -hmm. so parents are not at home as much anymore or both parents are now working and therefore children don't have that person to come to after school sometimes it's not their fault parents is fault by any means but it's just the change that has happened that um, makes those times uh, different from two generations ago one generation ago to now but you know is that at least in Romania we have this um saying that this generation is worse than the previous ones. Is this true or is just, you know, we are like, I don't know, every generation said, said, some, said that about the previous generation? Yeah, absolutely. That's very true. People definitely have their opinions, yeah. right? Um, and so 
I think one of the things that I keep going back to as a psychologist is the need for connection. Mm -hmm. Children need to connect to generations. Um, children need to learn from the past, but how are they going to do that if they don't connect, they, if they don't talk, if they don't have that relationship with the previous generations, if they don't have a relationship with their parents, if they don't have a relationship with their grandparents, for example. Um, so if we are going to compare, then sure, anyone can say, well, this generation is uh, better or that generation uh, is worse. But I think that we need to sit and think, what is the core need for children now? And focus on that to find solutions to create strategies, whether that is in the home or whether that is at school or whether that is in other environments such as a youth group or, for example, something similar to what Erasmus Plus is doing, mm -hmm. right? Trying to connect youth, trying to connect young people with different strategies, um, whether they be teaching strategies, learning strategies, but we can do that at a family level or at a school level and focusing on that instead of comparing 20 years ago to now, 30 years ago to now, 40 years ago to now, because the, the needs were, the needs were different, the access was different for people in general. Um, the time has changed. Mm -hmm. Work or jobs didn't ask people to come in at eight in the morning and leave at five in the afternoon. I don't know if that ha that is how it works in Romania, but that's how it works in my country. Um, people go to work at eight in the morning. So they leave their home at seven and they leave their work at five and they come back at six. So that's very little time, right, with the family. But it, it wasn't that way 40 years ago. Can you, I don't know, give us an example of a strategy that parents or teachers can use to connect with nowadays kids? Yeah, absolutely. So it's hard. <laughs> I have to commend teachers and parents because it is, it is hard. Um, none of us have all the answers. No one really does. Um, but yeah, absolutely. A strategy, I guess, would be connect. Find moments, find little moments throughout the day to connect mm -hmm. with your children. Um, so for parents, that starts in the morning. Hey, good morning, the, you know, how you wake up your children to go to school. Uh, don't just say, well, set up an alarm and let the alarm wake you up, right? <laughs> um, come into the room, say good morning to your kids in a very loving voice, uh, in a very loving way. Uh, very gentle. Come in and say, hey, good morning. It's time for you to go to school. You're going to go out and do great things today, you know, and believe in them. How did you sleep? You know, just a very simple question can help you connect. That means a lot. It means so much to the kids, right? To young kids and even teenagers, even when they don't want to respond. They definitely have a need for connection. And even if they don't tell you, and this is, I'm talking to the parents, right? Even mm -hmm. if they don't tell you, they will appreciate you saying, how did you sleep? How was your sleep? I'm so sorry that you didn't get good sleep today, but I know that you're gonna do great things in school today. I know that you have amazing teachers that are going to help you. So I know and I hope you have a great day, right? Um, so I think those little things, and then for teachers, yeah. which also have such a great role in life, is again, doing little things that become a routine in your classroom. So for example, every time your students come in the class, give them a high five, right? Or give them a different handshake. Um, each child can choose whether they want a specific handshake with their teacher. Um, or every Monday, take five minutes out of your class, which isn't a lot of time, but take five minutes out of your class and say, hey guys, let's stop, let's breathe, and let's be thankful for something. Let's be thankful that we have school today. Let's be thankful that we have toys. Let's be thankful that we have Wi-Fi. Whatever the kids want to say thank you for. And you can say different little things to say thank you. And all of a sudden, that is going to start to become a habit. But more than that, it's going to connect teachers to their students. Wow, that's, that's very, you know, at the first side, it's like simple things. Yeah. But that can make differences. Absolutely. Um, Talking about teachers, what qualities should, let's say, an engaged teacher have? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. I have to commend <laughs> teachers. They yeah. do such a great job. They really do. 
Um, and I think as teachers, you guys have such a massive responsibility, but it is a beautiful one, really. Um, okay, so what do you need? First of all, of course, you need to love your job. Of course, you need to love and care for children's lives, whether you're working with little ones, whether you're working with older ones in high school, maybe. Um, it's caring for them more than caring for the curriculum. I think as teachers, there's a lot of pressure in every country to, um, to finish a curriculum, right? Because you yeah. have to within a week, within two weeks, within a month. You have to cover certain topics or certain subjects. And of course, you know, that's, that's what you have to do. But more than that and going beyond that is caring for the students in their lives, how they really are. Learn to read your students. Learn to read them. Learn about personality. Maybe take some psychology courses. Um, take some behavior uh, courses, um, whether they're free or in university. Um, but prepare yourself for that. Read your students and take a look at how they are behaving. Because any change in behavior has a root. Any change in behavior is going to have a cause. And as a teacher, um, you can have a great impact in understanding this is a change in behavior. I need to take two minutes at the end of my class to ask that student how they are. Hey, or even if they don't want to talk about it, saying, hey, I know something's going on and I'm here for you, man, or I'm here for you as, you know, to girls and say, I'm here for you, I'm here to help you. If you ever want to talk about something, you're welcome to come to me or I can help you find someone to talk to. They appreciate that. They're not gonna say it most of the time, but they will appreciate it because they are going to feel seen. So as a teacher, I would say, care for your students, number one. Prepare yourself, as in study. Study behavior. And number three is to connect with them in, in that sense of, um, being there for them, making yourself available, taking notice of what really matters in children's lives. Yeah, it happens that there are a lot of you know teachers that are very clever, let's say, in their mm -hmm. topic or what they teach, Yeah. but they cannot connect with students. Mm -hmm. And uh, education stops there, you know? I mean, you cannot do education. I mean, mm -hmm. kids don't like you. If, if they don't like you, they don't, mm -hmm. they don't, res they don't respond to your asking questions or everything you, you need for them. Um, Absolutely. You, t you were talking about curricula. <clears throat> I'm teaching Romanian language. Mm -hmm. And uh, after eighth grade, they have an exam. Mm -hmm. And it's a very big pressure for me to finish and or to cover it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I try, as you said, as the beginning of every class mm -hmm. to have a small discussion with them. Hey, are you okay? Everything is okay. Mm -hmm. And after that, I go to, okay, today we're talking about our noun or adjective. Yeah. So yeah, we have to do that. Absolutely, that's yeah. fabulous. I think, you know, kids want to be seen. Mm -hmm. They want to feel heard. That's their biggest <coughs> need, whether they are one year old, two years old, five years old, 12, 15, 18, right? They want to be heard. They want mm -hmm. to be seen. So I think if we can do that at the end of the uh, beginning of every class, at the end of every class, beginning of the week, right? Whatever you choose, whatever strategy you choose, to choose it well, to remain consistent, and to keep that as your focus. Of course, curriculum is important, but children are always going to care more about being seen and being heard rather than what they learned from a book. Things that they can I don't know, forget, or they can Google it, you know? Right. Information is very uh, easy to find nowadays. It's yeah. not like the teacher is the, the only one that can give you the, that information. So yeah. we have to be more than just, you know, saying a poetry with that lesson. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, beside knowledge, mm -hmm. um, teachers should teach uh, children also some values. Mm -hmm. What values can a teacher, can we, yeah, can a teacher teach children mm -hmm. in school? What values? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I think number one, um, I think number one would be you are important. 
A teacher can come to a student or the entire class and make them feel seen, make them feel heard because they're human, right? Um, there's nothing worse, nothing worse as a psychologist for me to hear a student, to ask them how they're doing and for them to say, you know what, I'm doing just fine. And you're like, why? How come you're doing just fine? Well, no one cares. Um, my mom and my dad don't ask me how I'm doing. My grandparents don't care. They don't ask me how I'm doing. My teachers don't ask me how I'm doing. So I don't, I don't even exist. I shouldn't even exist. And that is scary, right? Mm -hmm. That's horrible. So I think as teachers and as parents, the first thing that we need to do is make them feel seen, make them feel heard. But how make can them I do be that? Important. Only through conversation? Um, not just through conversation. So there's different there's different things. Like I said, small little routines that you can add to the day. How you know how they're doing, the tone in your voice, looking into their eyes is super super important. When you look at someone in the eyes, then you know you matter. <laughs> that you're feeling hurt. Mm -hmm. You're like, wow, they're really interested in what I'm saying. But if if I ask you, hey, you know, Florentine, how are you? you know, how are you doing, I guess, and I just keep, you know, doing whatever I need to yeah. do over here, and I never make eye contact, am I even listening, <laughs> right? Repeating, repeating what they have said. So, for example, I gave the example of, hey, how was your, how was school today, right? Um, and then if the child says, oh, it was horrible because we had math tests and I didn't study and I didn't prepare, so instead of saying like, ah, well, okay, it's, you know, whatever, so instead of saying that, it's, or, or instead of saying, see, it was your fault because you didn't study or I told you. So instead of doing that, um, you can come to the child and say, I'm so sorry that you feel that way. You know, yeah, it does feel horrible, doesn't it? How, I mean, how do you feel about it? Or, hey, do you think there's anything I can help you with for next time? So all of a sudden they feel heard, but you also repeat. Oh, I hear that you had a really bad day because you know, this happened because your math test went really bad. I'm so sorry that that happened. You know, maybe next time I could help you. So all of a sudden they feel heard and they feel um, important and they feel seen. Um, other values we can teach them. So for us as adults is to remain consistent. Consistency is very important. Um, so for example, if we say we are going to do something, follow through. There's never something worse for a teenager uh, for us to say something, hey, you know, I'm going to bring you candies tomorrow, guys. And then the you next day, bring. you don't bring candy. Um, so that's a very small thing. But even um, saying to them, hey, I'm here for you. I'm here for you whenever you need me. And when they come to you, all of a sudden you're like, no, 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 I don't have time for you. So follow through. If you're going to say something, then mean it, right? Uh, that also teaches a different value, which is honesty. Being honest is so important. Um, I think a lot of parents always talk to um, about their teenagers, to psychologists, to teachers, and saying, "Oh, but they lie to me all the time, and you know they deceive me, or they told me this, but now they do this." So sometimes I think as adults we don't really understand that we're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. We are telling them one thing, but doing something very different, and they say it all the time. Teenagers are like, "Well, why should I listen to you? You always say this, but you do this, or you never do it." So to listen to them, because they're telling us what we're doing wrong. It's hard to hear as adults, mm -hmm. but that is the truth, right? It's one of the best feedbacks you can get. Absolutely, their point of view. <clears throat> so definitely looking at values like that. Um, <clears throat> honesty, right? Being seen and heard, mm -hmm. being important, and telling someone else that you're important, not just with your words, but with your actions. And I think the, the third one, and one of, one of the most important to me, is respect. Mm -hmm. The thing is, the value of respect is a process. The value of respect starts with connection. You have to connect with your kids. The second thing is you have to um, trust. When you connect, <coughs> then you trust. And when they trust, then they respect. And so I want it's you to a little keep the bit idea of because we, we have to take a break now. Sure. <coughs> and continue after that. Sounds good. <coughs> ok, um, vom continua imediat după un scurt uh, moment de publicitate, 
despre aceste subiecte tare interesante alături de invitata noastră. Revenim! Am revenit, suntem alături de uh, invitata noastră de astăzi, Rebecca Vega, psiholog uh, din Honduras, din America Centrală și discutam uh, cu ea despre strategii privind o educație de calitate și în, rămăseserăm înainte de pauza de publicitate la capitolul respect, ce înseamnă în viziunea unui psiholog, iată, respectul. Pentru că noi de multe ori cerem respect de la copii, dar poate de multe ori nu știm ce înseamnă sau îl tratăm superficial, nu înțelegem exact ce înseamnă termenul respect. So, Becky, we yeah. were talking uh, before the, the break about respect mm -hmm. and you started to say something that there are like three, three different uh, I don't know, steps, steps. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. please. Absolutely, yeah, in order to gain respect, right, yeah. with children or teens, even with other adults, in order to really, truly achieve respect, uh, to teach it or to have it, um, we need three steps. So the very first one is to connect. To connect with the other person is very important. Um, it's very hard for us to do anything with a person, even having a conversation, if we cannot connect. Usually, if we can't make eye contact, if we can't um, hold a conversation or share or differ on the same topic, um, it's going to be very hard for us to continue the conversation. We are usually going to have a very short conversation. Yes, no, finished. So, connect, connecting and having that connection. And from there, the more we connect, the more we build trust. Um, so all of a sudden, I start to trust the other person. A child, for example. The more I see a child, the more I play with a child, the more I do things with the child. So for even for parents, the more they do, the more the child trusts them. Mm -hmm. And then we achieve respect. Once a child trusts or a teenager trusts, then they respect because they know that they can rely on that person. And so therefore, respect is not just a thing we can demand. Mm -hmm. So think of teachers, for example, when you walk into a room and you say, hello guys, my name is Florentine or my name is Rebecca and I'm here to be your teacher for the rest of the year and now you have to respect me. That's going to be a pretty hard yeah. ask, especially yeah. in high school, because they're not going to respect you at all. They don't know you. And also respect is something very abstract for them. You know, it's not yes. something very concrete. To Absolutely. So what you have to do is connect with them. Look at them in the eye. Ask them about different things, what they like, what they like to do. And then also do things and activities with them that they would enjoy. So whether that is teaching languages or whether that is teaching like a physical education class, um, you're going to do things to connect with them and things that they like and that they enjoy and that you enjoy as well. And you yeah. are going to enjoy that time with them. And then after that, as time goes on, they're going to learn that they can trust you. They can come to you. You keep your word. You are consistent in what you say. You are honest with them um, at every point in time. And so they know that they are able to trust you. They're going to start seeing and testing and looking for things to say, hmm, can I trust my teacher, whoever that is? And then they're going to respect you. You can gain that trust and that respect within two weeks, within a week. And obviously, by the end of the year, mm -hmm. you're going to have quite a lot of it. <laughs> But it goes both ways, right? So it's the same with your students, even as, as uh, adults, right? You connect with your students when your students are also doing what they say they're going to do, like their homework or their studies, or they're going to bring something for a presentation. You start to trust them, right? Yeah. And then, of course, they gain your, your respect because you say, wow, I can rely on this student. This is a very good student. Or, well, it's harder for me to rely on this student, but there's things that I know I can trust my student with. So it goes both ways, but it is a process. It's not just mm -hmm. something I come in and I demand when it comes to respect. What are the areas of respect? Yeah, great. So I love this, this, and I guess I, I'll tell it to you as a story. Mm -hmm. So 
I am a psychologist, but one thing that maybe I, well, I shared with you yeah, I earlier is that I was teaching as well. So I was teaching from grade one, so six-year-olds, all the way up to tw uh, 12th grade, 11th grade, so 17, 18-year-olds. Um, and I did that for several years. And I taught science <laughs> to oh, them. Yeah. And so I came in. The very first time, the very first week of school, we started talking, we started doing activities, and then we also started talking about our classroom rules. So in the, in the classroom, I asked my students what rules they wanted first, and that helped me connect with them. That helped me know what it is that they want uh, out of the year, right? Yeah. What it is that they want out of each other, and what it is what they want out of me as a teacher. So it was very insightful. It gave me a lot of information. And then um, I said, okay, I love this. So I wanna share something with you guys. And they were like, what, what? So I said, well, I wanna share with you that I only have one rule. And they were just like, oh, no way, no way. And I said, yes, I only have one rule. And um, they were like, what is it, what is it? And I said, well, well in my classroom or in, when I'm here, we are going to respect each other. They're like, oh, yeah, we should, you know, it's something like new. And so I said, okay, so let's talk about three aspects of respect, which is your question. Mm -hmm. So the first aspect is we should respect ourselves. And so I started asking my students, what do you think that means, <coughs> right? What do you think that means? So they gave ideas. Well, respecting myself is having clean clothes and washing my hair and, um, well, showering and uh, brushing my teeth and eating well. Of course, that is respect towards yourself. You have to do that, you have to take care of yourself. So obviously it's very encouraging and saying yes. And why did I start with themselves? Because it's a whole lot easier for me to care about me because you know I need to take care of myself yeah. than to care about others first. So then we move on to the second part of respect. The second part of respect is we need to respect each other. So I talked to them about what does it mean to respect each other in this classroom and they came up with the ideas. So I'm connecting with them as I'm doing this. I'm building trust. And so when they said something, I heard it. I usually repeated it mm -hmm. and I wrote it down on the board. That showed them Becky or Miss Becky as I was called, she listens to me. She listens to what I'm saying. And they are important. And they are important. So all of a sudden, I'm building on honesty. I'm building on importance. I'm building on uh, their value as people. And you, right? you move the focus from the teacher. Absolutely. To the to this, I mean, we're there for, for students. We're exactly. not there to be teachers for other teachers. Mm -hmm. We are there mm -hmm. to teach students. They are at the core of education. So I asked them, how do you care for each other? So they started, or respect each other, and so they started giving ideas, right, as to how they care for each other. So don't take someone's pencil without permission. Don't rip the books. Always keep our classroom organized. Those are things they do for each other. I don't do it for them. They, they can mm -hmm. do it. And they take ownership of that, right? It's their classroom. It's not the teacher's classroom. It's their classroom. And they love that. They love taking that responsibility. And the third, um, the third step yeah. um, or aspect of, of respect is respecting our environment. Everything that is around us. So what is my environment or what that was for our students? So of course it was their classroom, their books, the entire school. So even let's pick up the trash, you know, let's, um, let's have other kids care for playing, for example. So the playground is important. Everybody can enjoy the playground, the soccer field. I don't know if you have these here, but I know in my country mm -hmm. we do. And so um, obviously kids are not gonna cut down trees in school, right? But they can take care of the equipment, yeah. their physical education equipment, their books, the library, you know, all these things. And so all of a sudden, <coughs> We, they understand that respect is not about doing what the teacher says. It's not really about um, just following rules, but it is about caring for themselves, caring for others, and caring for their environment. And they start to see that when they do this, there's positive effects in their life. 
And so all of a sudden, respect is not so ambiguous. It's mm -hmm. not so mm -hmm. abstract, but it's real. And it's little things that they do that show respect to themselves and to um, everything around them, even other people. One of the biggest problems uh, teachers face in their relationship with their students mm -hmm. is the lack of, um, how can I say, motivation. Yeah. Yeah, is the lack of motivation. What can teachers do to motivate uh, students at school? I mean, <clears throat> is there something we can do or motivation is something they just have it inside? Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, definitely moti there's, there's external aspects of motivation and internal aspects for motivation. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, I would say, let's follow the steps of respect, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go to motivation. So first and foremost, as a teacher, I need to motivate myself. What is my motivation? Why am I teaching? Why am I coming to school every day? So I need to motivate myself. Right? I need to enjoy what I'm doing. There's always going to be days that I don't enjoy, right? But we need to make all the other days count more than the days that don't or aren't so enjoyable or that don't seem to be the nicest days. Um, we need to know our purpose. What is my purpose as a teacher to be here teaching? Hmm. Is it the books? Is it the curriculum? Is it the money? Is it the government or is it my students? Wow. When we start looking at our students as lives, as people, as our future for our countries, it takes on a whole new meaning. My student is not a chair. My student is not a desk. Or my an student object. or an object. My student is a person. If they are six years old because they're in first grade, then they're a tiny person but they are a person. Mm -hmm. They have ideas, they have feelings. They're this beautiful little world. There's this beautiful little brain in there that is ready to take things in and also little mouths and little energies that bring beautiful things out. So when we look at it like that, then I find that that is the biggest motivation. And as a teacher, you have to be honest with yourself. I'm, you know what, I'm here for the money for two more years. Hmm. And you know what, that's fine, <clears throat> that's fine. But maybe let's talk about that motivation and how you can motivate yourself. Because when you motivate yourself, and if you come into your classroom with those kinds of attitudes, your students are gonna notice. They're gonna know, mm -hmm. oh, you know what? Florentine is here for <clears throat> us, he cares about us. He cares about life, not just a book, not just whether I memorize or know certain parts of the book. And the cool thing is, that's the second part. We motivate our students with our attitude. When, so this is a really cool fact, and that is that for communication, we have verbal, nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication is 93% of how we communicate to people. So I communicate nonverbally to people. My actions, my face, how, what my face looks like, am I smiling, am I angry, right? Um, my body language, everything about my body language, if I'm like this every morning, or if I'm like, hey guys, you know, um, that makes a difference. My tone of voice, the volume of my voice. I think if all of a sudden I lower my voice like this, and I start to slow down what I'm saying, things, sound very serious but if I'm a little bit have a different intonation and I'm more motivated and excited all of a sudden things seem more fun so all of my nonverbal communication means a whole lot more that's 93 percent of communication and my words and the books are only seven percent <laughs> So definitely, I think we need to take a very different approach to education than maybe what, than what we have been doing before. But we, that's how we motivate our students, with first motivating ourselves, then motivating our students, and then changing the environment around us. What can you do as a teacher to change the environment in your classroom? What can you do? What activities can you find in your books 
that would that you can change just a little bit and that it's allowed to make it more fun to make it more relevant right maybe maybe instead of reading something two or three times maybe we play a game with hmm. the words or maybe we write it and they have to treasure hunt so yes it takes a little bit more work as a teacher but if i'm motivated then my students are going to be motivated and our environment is going to be motivated therefore if i'm motivated and i pass it on to my students with my nonverbal communication mostly and the little bit of my words then we will be able to change our environment in our classroom and all of a sudden i want to be in the classroom with my students i don't feel like i'm going back to the classroom and be like oh i'm going to go see these kids again no, 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 I'm here for you. I love coming to class with you. And then our students are gonna have the same attitude. They're gonna say, I, I wanna go to class with Florentine. I love being in that class. We do, we do things differently. Maybe not every day, maybe not every week, but you keep it interesting by motivating them in that yeah, way. And most of the time, kids don't, re or children, students, don't remember theory you teach them. It's like they remember how they Feel, they feel yes. during that class. Yes. You know, in Romania, in order to become a teacher, you have to pass an exam. We call it titularizare. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, something that with, yeah. with a lot of uh, questions about your topic and everything. But <clears throat> one of the questions I'll put in that exam would be that one you said, why am I teaching? Mm. Why am I there? Yeah. Because I can know a lot of things, you know, like theoretical things, but what and why do I do that? Mm -hmm. So if I answered correct to that question, probably my educational uh, act is going to be a success. Yeah. Okay, uh, I want to, um, to go to another question that I uh, prepared for you. What methods can we use in daily classroom life? Like very practical methods a teacher can use in order to connect with their student or to make children enjoy school. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think in the beginning, right, I think I said maybe high-fiving your students or having a, a handshake. So that's just one idea. It could work in your class and it could not work in your class. And I think that's something we have to really um, take into account when it comes to different methods, when we look for them. We can try them out and we need to try them out maybe three, four, five or six times and they may work or they may not work and that's okay. We find something else. So um, definitely checking in with your students, doing a check-in. So I remember I had a literary class with my high school students and obviously they had to write. Mm -hmm. Now it said they had to write an essay they had to write a poem, they had to write an article, right? All these things. So one of the things that we did is we had a notebook and I said, awesome. Well, you're going to write an essay about what is your motivation in life. Or I would ask them, you have to write an article about the one topic that you find the most important and it can be anything. And I had a student <clears throat> raise their hand and say, can I, talk about video games? I said, absolutely, I would love to learn about video games. So doing things that you can in your classroom, but shifting it towards the student. So for example, in a literary class, they have to write an essay. They have to write a poem or, or a story. But maybe we can change the subject to something that they like. Therefore, it will help us connect with them. I also um, would tell them, hey, I want to check in with you. I want to have different check-ins. And so what that meant is in my classroom, um, I had it on my desk, and sometimes I carried it to every class, <laughs> but I had a little jar, and in that jar I had, I don't know if you have them here, but tongue suppressors, like they're made out of wood, and doctors use them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so they would have a name, <laughs> right? And colors, and they would have the student's name. And so the student could come up at any time during my class, they could come and pick up one of the sticks with their name and they could put it right next to me. And what that told me, and I would share this with them before, like at the beginning of the year, what that told me was, hey, I need to chat with you. So if it was red, 
it was like something very important. So if there was time, I, we would go outside and talk or I would find that student like as fast as I could during the day because I knew I needed to talk to that student that day. If their color was green, then it meant that they needed, they needed help, but maybe not so urgently. And if it was blue, then they had something good to share with me. So they could pick it out and they could give it to me whenever they need it. In another class, we had notebooks and we had diaries. And so they had to write something they were grateful for, something they were struggling with um, for, I think, I believe it was like only three minutes on Mondays, like the first day of the week. And then I said, okay, so on my desk, there is a green paper and there's a red paper. If you put your notebook on the red paper, then I will not read your notebook. It's hmm. private. I won't read okay. it and I will respect that. But if it's on the green paper, then I will take it with me and I will read it. So those are just little strategies that you can think of. These are ways mostly, again, to connect with your students. That's what they need. If I could say, that the students needed one thing in this life, it's connection. And so any of these strategies, what they need um, to do or to have as, a, as the core element to become relevant is connection. Is that strategy, and you can go online and find many strategies. You go online as a teacher and find it, but will that strategy help me connect with the student? When I'm high-fiving the student, am I looking at them in the eye? Am I looking at their face? Am I looking at their nonverbal communication at their body language and what is it telling me are they energetic today are they sad today are they feeling depressed are they anxious what is it that they're doing right what what is it that they're telling me with their body language um, if I have other strategies like the notebook then again I'm going to respect I'm going to be honest and I'm going to teach the values that I'm talking about in class we need to follow through with them every single day but there are situations that no matter how good or creative or engaged are you as a teacher mm -hmm. that you cannot connect with some students and more of that like those students can create problems how can we deal with it with this kind of students that create problems absolutely um, I think that's that's always the way that teachers see it mm -hmm. and express it, even parents sometimes yeah. or the schools. So first and foremost, I think we have to really remember that um, students are people and at the core, right? So if you think of a tree, we see the tree, we see the trunk, we see the leaves, but there's roots under, under the soil and any student that has any behavior, whether it's excitement, whether it's anger, whether it's boredom, whatever they're having, whatever attitude and behavior they're having, those are like the behaviors, like the leaves of the tree. But there is a cause. What is the cause? Could mm -hmm. it be family problems? Could it be that they have no friends? Could it be a bullying issue? Could it be an abuse issue from a peer or someone else? And then we also need to know and remember that there are roots to that problem that's lying underneath that we cannot see. And I think when we see that, when we focus on the root of the behavior of the problem and not the, the behavior up top, then we will find solutions. And I think that's exactly, that's exactly another thing that we need to do is changing our language and how we refer to students. Mm -hmm. So they are not a problem student. They are a student that has a problem. And maybe I need to figure out what that problem is or what that root of the problem is. Or maybe I need help from a psychologist, from a therapist, from the parents, from the principal of the school. Um, maybe I need help from another teacher to help me find the root of the problem. But I think that is the key phrase. Mm -hmm. The student is not the problem. They are a student, a person that yeah. has a problem. Mm -hmm and we can help with that. And the thing is, the core, the very base of the need, when there's a behavior, bad or good, especially bad behavior or 
um, anger or whatever that behavior is, there's always a need for human connection. Always, always, always. Um, and so when we look at it that way, we as teachers start to change our perspective. I no longer see the student as the problem. I no longer am angry at the student, but I know that they have a problem. So it becomes my mission to find out what that is and to help the student. My mission is not to solve the problem. So I want to be clear with that. It's yeah. not, I can't solve the problem necessarily, but I can help find solutions. And to me, that's the key from an educational perspective and also from a psychological perspective. Well, Becky, that was a very interesting discussion. And I'm very thankful that you, you accepted my invitation to come here. We have only one more minute from my TV show. So in one sentence, say something to the, I don't know, the teachers or the parents mm -hmm. that they should uh, <laughs> re remember. Remember. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I think this has been such an honor, something I did not expect to do at all in Romania, but it's been very interesting, and, and you're doing such a great job as a teacher as well. So I know, I know that your students enjoy thank being you. with you. Um, and I think to the parents and to the teachers, I would say I encourage you. You guys are doing such a great job. We live in a world where there is so many difficulties. There are so many challenges for teachers and for our students. But I think I would leave you with this. You're doing a great job. You're doing the best that you can, and students will respond to that. Figure out your motivation, number one. Number two, figure out how you can connect with your students. That is going to absolutely change everything. And number three is look at your students as important human beings. They are not the problem, but their behavior is telling you that they have a problem. And so you can help. You're not there to carry the burden of a solution, but you are there to just walk them through some possibilities. And that is going to change their life forever. And so with that, you are doing this amazing, amazing job. Um, you are forming uh, people and adults for the future. That's not an easy task, but you are definitely doing the best that you can. So keep at it, keep going. Well, I have to say it again, you are amazing. Thank you Thank again you. for being here. And uh, I don't know, enjoy Romania as much as you, you can. And I hope you had a good time here. Yes. Uh, vă Thank mulțumim you so și dumneavoastră much. pentru că ne-ați urmărit. Sperăm că v-a plăcut această emisiune și invitata noastră de astăzi. Nu uitați, ne puteți urmări și pe, uh, în fiecare miercuri și vineri pe Columna TV de la ora 18, precum și pe Facebook și pe YouTube Florentin Profu de Română, unde postăm aceste emisiuni și le puteți distribui, puteți comenta, puteți lăsa feedback uh, pe curând.